Enolates are the conjugate bases of carbonyl compounds. And in this video, we're going to learn how to choose the right base for enolate formation to form the enolate that we want and talk a little bit about the general reactivity of enolates as nucleophiles. And so, like enols, enolates are profoundly nucleophilic at the alpha position, and the second best resonance form of the enolate shows us this. They're also nucleophilic at oxygen, though, and so they're often referred to as ambident nucleophiles, nucleophiles with two reactive sites, carbon and oxygen. And so, in general, electrophiles can react with either the oxygen or the alpha carbon to give two different products. If an electrophile reacts with the oxygen, we get something that resembles an enol ether or something along those lines with some functional group connected to the enol oxygen and the e basic enol structure sort of still built in here with the carbon-carbon double bond. This is usually undesirable. Typically, we're interested in making a bond between carbon <laughs> and the electrophile, since we love carbon-carbon bonds and pretty much carbon-anything bonds in organic chemistry. And so carbon attack is usually more desirable due to the new CE bond that's established here. And so the vast majority of, for example, research efforts and reaction development efforts over the years have been centered on encouraging and optimizing for formation of this carbon-E bond, what we'll call C attack. And pretty much from here on out, we'll very, very rarely see O attack. There are certain electrophiles, silo electrophiles come to mind where O attack tends to be favorable. The vast majority of electrophiles we'll look at will be optimized for carbon E bond formation. When it comes to generating an enolate from a neutral carbonyl compound, what we need is a Bronsted base, something to pluck a proton off of the alpha position. And there are two general classes of bases that you'll see used for this purpose, reversible and irreversible bases. Reversible bases are not that strong. You know, one thing we need to keep in mind here is, is that uh, carbonyl compounds are not that acidic. And so alkoxide bases, you know, sodium methoxide, sodium ethoxide, sodium hydroxide, which is in that same class of just an unstabilized O minus, only deprotonate at the alpha position to a small extent. For example, if you take acetone and you mix it with the ethoxide anion, the favored side of this acid-base equilibrium is the left-hand side with the negative charge on ethoxide. The enolate is generated only to a very small extent. That's why we call this reversible deprotonation, since by and large it's the reverse reaction that dominates. However, Reversible deprotonation is sometimes useful. It may look like this isn't useful for very much since we generate only a very small amount of the enolate. However, if we can consume that enolate so that Le Chatelier's principle kicks in and we make more of it, and we can do that without problematic side reactions, for example, without the carbonyl compound reacting with itself, if that's undesirable, then reversible deprotonation can work great. And alkoxide bases are great for certain carbonyl compounds with enhanced acidity, as we'll see a little bit later in this video. If we want to generate the enolate quantitatively in 100% yield, 100% conversion from the starting carbonyl compound, we've got to ramp up the strength of the base. And the two types of bases typically used here are hydrogen anions and nitrogen anions. So hydride bases, such as sodium hydride, and N- bases, such as sodium amide, NaNH2, and others. Let's look at sodium hydride first. We can do a quick pKa comparison here to justify the use of H- as a base. The product acid has a pKa of 35, that's H2, and the reactant acid, alpha to the carbonyl compound, has a pKa of 20, and this pKa is typical of the alpha position of carbonyl compounds. 20 is a good benchmark to keep in mind for ketones. So this is a heavily favored deprotonation with the stronger acid on the left-hand side and the weaker acid on the right-hand side, pretty much irreversible. That's why we're using a forward arrow here. It's also common to use amide bases with negative charge on a nitrogen, and lithium diisopropyl amide, or LDA, is one that we'll use very, very commonly. Here again, we've got a pKa of about 35 in the conjugate acid of LDA, which is just diisopropyl amine, and the pKa of 20 for acetone. So again, this is a heavily favored reaction in the forward direction, and conversion to the enolate happens completely. The carbonyl compound is entirely and completely converted 
to enolate like this. So this is a great way to generate the enolate quantitatively if we need to avoid issues with only a small amount of the enolate being generated in the first case, which is actually quite common, as we'll see. Now, for 1,3 or beta dicarbonyl compounds and other compounds where the acidic position is linked to two resonance electron withdrawing groups, alkoxide bases work great, and this includes hydroxide, of course, so ethoxide, methoxide, hydroxide are the most common bases used here. These actually work great, and now notice our arrow has changed from reversible and favoring the reactants, in the case of a plain vanilla ketone, like acetone, to entirely favoring the products in the case of a 1,3-dicarbonyl compound like acetyl acetone. The reason for this is that the, well, first of all, the pKa difference does favor the products. Ethanol is a weaker acid than the starting beta-dicarbonyl compound, and the structural reason for this is that the negative charge in the conjugate base in the enolate is heavily stabilized. We'll refer to this as a stabilized enolate, since it has an additional resonance form derived from pushing electrons into the other, the second electron withdrawing group connected to the carbonyl carbon. So for example, this has a resonance form in which negative charge is shared by, or is, is located on, the other oxygen atom, showing that the negative charge here is shared by not one, but two oxygens, as well as the alpha position. So these stabilized enolates can readily be deprotonated by alkoxide bases, and this tends to be true almost regardless of what the other withdrawing group is. If this is a cyano, a sulfonyl, uh, a nitro, all of these can be deprotonated completely by alkoxide bases. The figure at the bottom of this slide essentially summarizes the discussion to this point in terms of choosing a base for enolate formation. We use an alkoxide base in conjunction with plain vanilla ketone such as acetone, we get small amounts of the enolate at equilibrium, and in equilibrium we have a mixture of the enolate and the starting acetone with acetone predominating here, based on pKa arguments. If we use a stronger base, like sodium hydride or LDA, we get irreversible and complete formation of the enolate. So at equilibrium there is no carbonyl compound left, there's no neutral keto form left, the enolate is all that's present in solution. And if LDA is used, we get a lithium enolate where Li plus is the counter ion to the negatively charged enolate. We use sodium hydride, we get a sodium enolate where sodium is the counter cation. And typically, we'll ignore that cation. That can have important practical implications if you're actually running reactions with enolates, solubility, so reactivity, so on and so forth. But we'll generally ignore that counter ion treated as a spectator in reactions of enolates. With beta-dicarbonyl compounds and other so-called activated methylene or active methylene compounds, where we have a methylene or CH2 group flanked by two electron withdrawing groups, now we can just use hydroxide or alkoxide bases and we get irreversible and complete deprotonation to give the stabilized enolate. So here, LDA is not necessary and is generally not employed because it's a pain in the butt to handle relative to something like sodium hydroxide or sodium alkoxides.